in our verses today as we continue reading through the book of James. We will again be in chapter 3, and we will pick up exactly where we left off last week. And once again, in our verses today, we will be reminded how James is such a practical book of the Bible with real-life advice for having a real-life faith and what that looks like in our daily, regular behavior. Because like James has told us before, if following Jesus doesn't affect your behavior for the better and how you treat people, then you're not actually following Jesus. Let's see what more of chapter 3 has to say. This is a reading from James 3, verses 13 through 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. May God bless the reading of this holy word today. So James has us thinking about what it means to be wise and understanding. What it looks like to have wisdom and to show understanding. He's very quick to point out that being wise does not mean you're a know-it-all. It does not mean that you're always trying to impress everyone with how much you know and how much they don't. Mansplaining everything to everybody, whether they want to hear it or not. Instead, wisdom and understanding are shown and demonstrated by having humility, verse 13 said. That's because a person who is actually wise and understanding doesn't need to prove themselves. They are content with who they are, what they know, and what they don't know. And that's okay. Like, if you or anyone else wants to think I'm an idiot, go right ahead. That won't bother me. My wife and kids think that a lot. I'm used to it. Because I'm content with the things that I know. And I'm honest about all the many, many things I don't know. And I'm always trying to learn more. Now, if I or someone else was motivated by envy, selfish ambition, then their words and actions and attitudes would be a lot different. They would look for every opportunity to jump in and tell people what they think they know so that other people will think they know things. They will eagerly correct you if they think you're wrong. That's where the quick to listen and slow to speak advice from chapter one comes in handy for us. If you are motivated by selfish ambition, then that will cause a lot of problems in life and for those around you. Not just quick to speak and quick to get angry, but also not taming the tongue like our verses last week warned us. Selfish ambition will make yours and everybody else's life a lot harder. And you will talk a lot more just to prove yourself or to try and get your way. So that kind of wisdom is not from heaven, James said. 
It is unspiritual. It's worldly wisdom. And really, we can give it a description, a label. It's just immature is what it is. And really, that's what James is addressing for his readers throughout this whole letter. Growing out of immaturity. The immaturity that makes you quick to speak and correct people you think are wrong. The immaturity that leads to more judgment and less grace, more talk and less action. The immaturity where your words do more harm than good. James also says that if such a person then claims to be supported by their religion, then their religion is actually worthless. Why? Because it's not helping them be better, get better, grow, or mature. And it's certainly not helping other people do that either. So when there is an absence of maturity and humility, that's when selfish ambition and envy see their opportunity to jump in. So what is the result? Disorder is the result that verse 16 said. So if you hear in the news of a company or a group or something that is plagued with disorder, you can think of big bad examples like Enron, FTX, Theranos, Bernie Madoff, AIG, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, all those kind of big bad scandals, all that kind of disorder. Well, it's a safe bet that selfish ambition was ruling the day and there was an unfortunate lack of wisdom due to low levels of real maturity. It can happen anywhere. It's just the big stories we hear on the news, but it can happen anywhere that there are humans because it is a true human temptation. So it can happen in schools, governments, companies, committees, HOAs, definitely churches too. Working in and for churches most of my life, I've heard a lot of church stories that include all kinds of disorder and bad practices where people will lack wisdom or understanding or humility. Sneaky backroom deals, secret messages, under the table meetings, threats and pressures. Churches are like families. So that stuff can definitely happen in families too. Maybe around a table of some extended family members and not all of them are the most maturest of folk, but by golly, they are confident in their opinions for sure. It's kind of like we mentioned last week, how the less a person knows about something, the more confident they are in what they think. So that is definitely a recipe for awkward family holiday dinners, for sure. Chapter three, verse eight, talked about the deadly poison that can come out of people's mouths and really crank up the awkwardness in the room when it does. So if someone is spewing out some deadly poison, we need an antidote, right? There's poison, you gotta have an antidote. The antidote can be found in our verses today in verse 17. The antidote is an infusion of wisdom that comes from heaven. It's like a healing, soothing serum. So what's in it? Well, we heard some ingredients. The ingredients that are listed for this serum, this antidote, is to be peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. So that's, that's the antidote for the, the poison of the misguided selfish ambition. So I want you to think right now, think about what those qualities look like in a person. Think of people that you have known who are like that. 
think of people who are peace-loving kind of people. Think of someone who is considerate to everyone. Picture them in your mind. People who aren't pushy at all, they don't insist on getting their way. People who show mercy and forgiveness, and it has an effect. People who are impartial, unbiased, but they're always sincere. They mean what they say. Think about people with those qualities. I can think of a few. In fact, I'm looking at a few right now. There are many people in this room or watching from home with those qualities. I see kind people all around me. Maybe you have a lot of one or two of those qualities, but you could do with a bit more of some of the others. That's okay. It gives you something to work on. But now you've got your ingredients list. Now you know. You know what's needed for the healing serum that works as an antivenom to the kind of poison that is spewed by people who are quick to speak from unspiritual, worldly immaturity. And just know, this is going to be an issue that we all will need to address forever, forever. Not just right now, not just at this time with our country being extra divisive, not just during an election season either. This is one of those ongoing, always issues that we will need to address forever. Why? Because there will always be new people who need to grow. There will always be new humans who are coming into the world as a blessing who start out as little kids, not yet matured naturally. So we got to help them. We got to show them what maturity looks like and acts like and sounds like. We got to be a presence of wisdom for them so that they can be inspired in good and healthy ways. Selfish ambition is always going to be tempting for anyone who's ever been a kid before. Verse 15 even said that it was demonic, actually. So we must demonstrate a more excellent way, the most excellent way, like the Apostle Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 13. That's what we need to model. And if you read all of 1 Corinthians 13, you will find out what it is. You will read the secret. Spoiler alert, it's love. That's the most excellent way. That's what it is that we must demonstrate. There will always be new people who need to grow. A lot of times there will be old people who need to grow. I mean, I'm not done maturing yet, and neither are any of you completely done and finished maturing yet. We can all increase in wisdom and understanding. We all have learning and growing to do. That's why we also need to help other adults who maybe have stopped maturing so much, like their maturity kind of plateaued in adolescence. We all have growing to do, so we should all welcome it and encourage it. Anything that can help with that? Yes, the antidote. The antidote for immaturity that we mentioned earlier. The antidote for rampant, selfish ambition that causes disorder. So do you remember what ingredients are in it? Being peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Those are the ingredients you need to fill yourself with so that you can be ready. We need to be full of that. I mean, we're going to be full of something. So just make sure you're full of the good stuff, okay? 
That way, when you share your wisdom, it will be, first of all, pure. You want pure wisdom? Not wisdom that you have dirtied up with your own bias, immaturity, selfish ambition. And if you can share some of that pure, straight from heaven kind of wisdom, then you get to be one of those peacemakers that verse 18 mentioned at the end of our text. Peacemakers who sow in peace, that raise a harvest of righteousness. That sounds great. Let's do that. Let us seek peace and pursue it, like Psalm 34, 14 says. Or blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for they will be called children of God. So let's do that. Let's seek peace. Let's really pursue it and then be blessed. That sounds great. Seek peace and pursue it. Pursue it. Don't just pray for it and then do nothing. I mean, yes, do pray for peace. But if you're just going to pray for peace, then once the commercial break is over, go back to watching TV, that's it's not really going to cut it. That's not pursuing anything. To really pursue something, it means actually doing something. It's a reaching for it. It's kind of like whenever something bad in the world happens, everyone jumps on their keypads and types thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Like whenever there is yet another mass shooting that happens so regularly here and everyone gets on Twitter, sorry, X, and says thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Well, is that really pursuing? Is that really reaching and building for peace? If that's the only thing you're doing, I don't know. Now, if someone said, I'm sending my thoughts and my prayers and I'm following them up with my actions, then yes, they are working to actually pursue getting some of that peace done like the Bible tells us to do. I mean, Psalm 34, 14 did not say, seek peace when you feel bad about something, but don't like let it mess up your schedule or whatever. I do not think it said that. It said, seek peace and pursue it. Reach for it. Strive for it. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. So if we want to raise a harvest of righteousness, that means we need to do some planting and some sowing of peace. If you've got a physical garden out in the world, you can't just pray that your garden will grow beautifully and expect God to do all the work, but you don't get out and put your sweat equity and your hard work into that garden at all, what's going to happen? You got to do some work, some planting, some sowing, if you want to produce actual fruit or flowers in your garden. You have to want it. You have to pursue it reach for it. Get your hands dirty. And the same goes for having wisdom and understanding. You have to do it. You have to reach for it. You have to show it. Verse 13, the very first verse we read today said, who is wise and understanding among you? Well, let them show it by their good life by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. That means you're not actually going to be wise and understanding if you're not showing it with humble deeds. 
And humble deeds, they, they don't have to be seen by anybody. It's the humble deeds that are the proof that wisdom and understanding is in you. If there's not one, then there's not the other. Emphasis on the humble, though. Nobody has to know. They don't have to be seen by anybody. Like there are people here at our church who are serving and doing all throughout the week, performing humble deeds that no one sees. Writing cards of support, fixing toilets that are broken, planting flowers outside, painting walls, serving popcorn, coming in weekend after weekend, night after night to work on that one weird power outlet upstairs. <laughs> and nobody sees it. Well, that's okay. God certainly does. Those are deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And like Jesus said in Matthew chapter six, when you do good things to help people, do them in secret. Then your heavenly father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. If you claim to be wise, but then you don't have any humble deeds, James isn't buying that. James says no. So if you want to be wiser, if you want to grow in wisdom, that's a good place to start. Start doing more deeds done in humility, things that help and serve people. You don't have to talk while you're doing it. You don't have to get credit. Nobody needs to know. But the more humble deeds you do for neighbors and strangers, the more wisdom you will develop. Hands-on learning. Got it? Good. What's that you say? You need an example? Like a model to follow? Well, I'm glad you asked because we have the perfect one. We have Jesus, our guide, Jesus, our Lord, Jesus, who shows us grace, Jesus, who helps us realize abundant life starting right now and lasting forever. So here you go. It's all right there. Philippians chapter two, verses three to five. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. That's it. Let's do that. And as we do, as we spread the peace of Christ that passes and supersedes all understanding, we will get to delight in a harvest, a bountiful harvest of blessings and of righteousness. So let's do that. Let us pray. Oh God, we confess that so often our words and our actions have been motivated by our own selfish ambition. That we have acted out of immaturity or anxiety or envy. And all it has done is cause disorder in our lives and in others. So we confess that. We thank you, O oh God, for always wanting to forgive us for always wanting to pour out your grace and to wash us clean so that we don't have to be held back in our old worldly immature ways, but that through your forgiving grace, we are set free to grow and excel and thrive in abundance. So we pray that you would bless our work and our deeds this week 
that they would be done with humility, that we can always be sincere, peace-loving, impartial, show mercy, produce good fruit, and to enjoy that harvest of righteousness. But we might need your push, O oh God. We might need you to push us to actually work and pursue the kind of peace that you dream for your world. Help us to be your kind of peacemakers, and then we will truly be blessed. Amen.